My name is Joy Konstead, and the story I want to tell is the story of my older brother. When I last saw Peter, he was in the London morgue. His life was complex, and the feeling his sudden death left me with was unresolved. Peter was born in South Porcupine in 1938. Our parents, Dorothy and Bert Rowe, were of British and Newfoundland heritage. When Peter was born, he wasn't expected to live. The roof of his mouth was missing and he was kept in a simple warm brick incubator. Later in life, he developed rheumatic fever and was kept in bed for a year. With our mother's fine nursing, Peter continued to study. He kept chemistry sets, stamp collection, learned shorthand. He developed photographs and he broadcast over a two-way radio. When he returned to school, he skipped two grades. His damaged heart presented a challenge for him, and he always wanted to battle that and present himself as though he was well and healthy. So he learned to box, he took up paper route, he uh, remained as active as he could to show people that he wasn't going to be beat by what his health had brought him. Peter became an example to follow, and when I followed him into high school, I was always having his standard held up to me. It was a standard that I could not meet. He entered McGill at the age of 15 and followed that with a master's degree at UBC and then on to Britain for University College and a PhD. When he first graduated with a PhD, his posting was to University College of the Gold Coast, Ghana. There, he learned to love both anthropology and archaeology and his passion for travel. After his stint in Africa, where he met his first wife, Nomi, he accepted a position at the University of Durham in Northern England. There he joined the mathematics department and was a rebel. His dress with jeans and a cape set him apart from his colleagues. The locals called him the Canadian and his letters home provided us with insights into his many, many adventures as he traveled throughout the world. I once was traveling with him and I remember urging him when we were in a mosque in the Middle East to take off his shoes. Peter refused. And this was not unlike his behavior. But there was a charitable side to my brother. As well, he was very engaging with his students who found him often an ally. Ironically, he thought his students were laid back a charge that one of his professors made of him. Mr. Rowe, you're a lazy son of a bitch and this will not do. Towards the end of his life, he would go to Evensong in Durham Cathedral. It was a place he learned to love. I think that the fact that Durham was a significant heritage site was one of the factors that kept him in Durham. On the other hand, some of the British practices were what offended his colonial roots, and he remained a rebel. By the end of Peter's life, there was not much around the world that he hadn't seen, but Yemen was on his bucket list. He was excited about the trip and ignored the foreign office's advice not to travel there. At the end of 1998, Peter said that those who are kidnapped are always released. Peter and Claire, his second wife, had
travel together with a small tourist group. And at the time that he was kidnapped, along with the other visitors, they were traveling in convoy. The trucks were stopped and the kidnappers took them and walked them into the countryside. There's a book that was written about this event and in it there's a short description of how my brother died. Moments later, the kidnapper we called Grey Shirt, realizing the battle was lost, began executing the hostages from left to right. A high velocity bullet struck Peter Rowe in the upper rear of his left arm and traveled through his chest, causing immediate death. In all, four of the hostages were killed and the remaining returned to their homes in Britain, the USA and Australia. When I last saw Peter, he was lying in the morgue in London where he had been returned after being murdered. His body was completely covered by a white cloth except for his face. His mouth was at an awkward angle, but otherwise it was my brother Peter. Over the 60 years of his life, Peter lived life to the fullest. He was eccentric, a maverick, and someone who indulged his every want. Although Peter had always said that he wanted to be buried with our ancestors in Trinity, Newfoundland, he isn't. His grave is on Church Street in Durham. His gravestone has a maple leaf to indicate that he's a Canadian and the word mathematician. To remember him, I endowed the Peter Rowe Memorial Postgraduate Prize for outstanding performance in mathematical science or particle theory.